Welcome to this week of Long-Term Financial Management. My name is Kirby Arkundiv. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. This week we will be discussing capital investment decisions. Capital investment decisions are some of the most important decisions that a company makes. They involve investments of large amounts of money that potentially could not be returned for years. If companies make the wrong decisions, they could potentially lose a lot of money or go bankrupt. If they make the right decisions, they could be extremely successful. There are a lot of tools, mathematically, that companies can use in attempting to evaluate whether or not potential projects could be profitable. These include things like net present value, which will be in dollars or whatever currency the company is looking at, internal rate of return, which will be in percent, modified internal rate of return, which will be in percent, payback period, which could be in years, and discounted payback period, which will also be in units of years. The most important part of doing one of these calculations is not the math itself, it is estimating the numbers that go into the equations. So things like if a company starts a new project, let's say a movie, well, what will the sales of the movie be like? Will they make money off the initial box office? Will they make money later off of DVDs, Netflix, other streaming issues? What will their cost of capital be? If they use variable financing, will interest rates go up? What will other input costs, such as gasoline, be, or labor costs, be over the life of the project? Net present value, again, is in dollars. It is the dollar amount that it is estimated that investing in the project will either increase the value of the company or decrease the value of the company. So normally, if NPV is greater than zero, you would invest in the project. If NPV is less than zero, you would not invest in the project, unless it's something that you sort of have to do anyway on the side of a company like a new waste disposal program. One of the calculations a company may do when determining whether or not to invest in a new project is the net present value calculation which will be in dollars, since all of the cash flows that goes into a project, whether initial or later, will be in dollars. The NPV is calculated by estimating the net cash flows each year, all of the potential revenues minus all of the potential costs, divided by 1 plus the working average cost of capital for that year, taken to the teeth power, and commonly, the initial year's investment is subtracted out, which would be cash flow zero. If NPV in dollars is positive, then that is the dollar amount that investing in this project will add to the value of the company. If it is negative, then that is the dollar amount that investing in this project will subtract from the value of the company. As an example, we will consider ABC Company which is considering a new project when the cost of capital is 10%, has estimated cash flows of initial upfront investment of minus 100, could be million dollars, and then they expect to make 30 million in year one, 20 million in year two, and 70 million in year three. We ask what is the project's net present value, and should the company invest in the project? These calculations can be done by hand, but it is easiest to do them either in Excel or with a financial calculator. If you do them in Excel, you would use this equation, equals NPV of 0.1 for the interest rate, cash flow in year one, year two, and year three, minus the initial investment, and you end up with an NPV of minus $3,610,000 since this is a negative, the company would lose money by investing in the project, so it would not choose to do so. Another calculation a company might do when considering investing in a project is the internal rate of return, which will be in percent. This is the discount rate 
that will make NPV zero, or the break-even rate of return. So this is similar to the rate of return that an investor would make from purchasing a bond. The internal rate of return is the cost of capital that will drive the net present value of all the cash flows to zero or will drive the NPV to zero. It is calculated by doing an iteration of basically guessing IRR over and over again until you get a zero, which would take a very long time period to do by hand. But of course, computers with their financial calculators, our Excel can do very quickly. A graph of the net present value versus the discount rate shows the point at which the internal rate of return drives the NPV to zero. And you can see if the discount rate is below the internal rate of return, the NPV is positive. If the discount rate is above the internal rate of return, the NPV is negative. This is for a simple IRR where there is only one crossing point. In more complex equations, you can end up with multiple crossing points, in which case the IRR calculation does not work properly, and you have to use something like the MIRR, or Modified Internal Rate of Return. The IRR is sort of like the rate of return interest rate from a bond. So if you borrow at a WAC and you invest in an IRR that is greater than your borrowing rate, like you borrow at a bank and invest in a bond that pays a higher interest rate than the interest rate you pay at the bank, then you have made money and you can invest in the project. On the other hand, if your borrowing costs are higher than your rate of return from investing in a project, then you will lose money on the project, and you would generally not invest in the project. As an example, again, consider ABC Company, and it's considering a new project with a cost of capital of 10%. Once again, we have the estimated cash flows of an initial investment of $100 million, followed by a rate of return in year one of $30 million, in year two of $20 million, and in year three of $70 million. And we ask, what is the project's internal rate of return, and should we invest in the project? Again, this calculation can be done with either a financial calculator or Excel. We show the simple results here in this video. More detailed calculations are done in some of my other videos, but you can just say equals IRR and then the cash flows involved, where these are the cash flows for the project, and you end up with an internal rate of return of 8.23%. Since you're back, your borrowing cost is 10. You borrow at 10, invest at 8.23, you would lose money and not invest in the project. How about if you have two different projects to choose from and they are mutually exclusive, you can only choose one. It is convenient in this case to calculate a crossover rate. The crossover rate is going to be the point where the net present value of the two projects is equal. When calculating the crossover rate, intuitively you can get an idea of the behavior of the NPVs of the different projects by knowing the timing of their cash flows. So a project that makes most of its profits very quickly, you get your investment back very quickly, is going to be a lot less dependent on increases in interest rates, increases in the cost of capital, than a project that makes its profits later on. This is the same thing if you would look at a bank account versus a long-term bond. The value of the bank account does not fluctuate with interest rate increases. If interest rates go up, on the other hand, the value of the bond goes down. And the longer the duration are, in simplistic terms, the maturity of the bond is, the more the value of the bond goes down.
if we look at two different projects here, Project A and Project B, we can see Project A's total cash flows are higher than B's. If we set the cost of capital at zero, then we just sum up the cash flows for each project. We get one that's higher for A than B. But as the cost of capital increases, Project A's NPV drops much quicker than B's. So Project A would be like the long-term bond or a high-tech stock that's sort of speculative and you're investing money now and you hope you'll get it back later. Whereas Project B would be a much shorter-term bond as interest rates go up, its value does drop, but not nearly as quickly as B's, or a value stock which is currently making money. The point at which these two NPVs equal each other is called the crossover rate. We're not going to do the calculations of how to find that in this video, but I have a separate video that does that in great detail. A, another calculation that we can look at is the modified internal rate of return. Um, as we mentioned, the internal rate of return sometimes gives completely incoherent results, in which case you would use the modified internal rate of return. To calculate the modified internal rate of return, you would set the future value of the profits equal to the present value of the costs or the negative cash flows at times 1 plus MIRR to the N. You would then rearrange this calculation, take future value divided by present value to the 1 over N minus 1 to get the MIRR. Again, I have another video that goes through this in great detail, so I will not cover the MIRR calculation in this overview video. How about the payback period? This is an estimate of how long an investor has to wait to make his or her capital back. It calculates the number of years until the cumulative net cash flow is zero. It ignores time value of money. And one of the assumptions in the payback period are the cash flows occur evenly throughout the year. This wouldn't be the case, for example, in retail, where a large fraction of the sales, of course, occur around the Christmas season. Or for a resort in, we'll say, the Caribbean, where a large fraction of the sales would occur in nice warm months down there in January and February, which are very cold up in the United States. Again, we will look at a project with an initial investment of 100 million, cash flow in year one of 30 million, two of positive 20 million, and three of 70 million. And we will ask, when do we get our money back? So initially we invested 100 million. First year we get back 30 million, we're still down 70 million. Next year we get back 20 million, we're still down 50 million. Next year we get back 70 million, and at the end of that time period we were up 20 million. So we break even sometime between year two and three, and the way we estimate the time between year two and three is we say, okay, we still owe 50 million at the beginning of the year, we get 70 million in that year, so we take five divided by seven. And then we see at the bottom of our screen here, the payback is two, since we break out even between year two and three, plus five sevenths are 2.71 years. Again, this calculation is also done in another video. The discount payback, unlike the payback period, also includes time value of money so you take into account the interest rates you have to pay on any money you borrow. So the discount payback period will be longer than the payback period since you are paying interest to a bank. So the discounted cash flow is going to equal the cash flow again divided by one plus the interest rate to the number of years, just like any present value calculation. If our cost of capital is 10%, then we will calculate cumulative discounted cash flows 
and determine whether or not to invest in the project. So we start out again with the same cash flows of minus 100 million, followed by 30 million positive, 20 million 70. And we can see under the cumulative cash flow calculation, we broke even between year and three, year two and year three. Well, now if we discount the cash flows, the one in year zero isn't discounted at all. The one in year one is going to be discounted as 30 divided by 1.1 which gives us 27.27. The one in year two is going to be 20 divided by 1.1 squared, which is 16.53. And year three is 70 divided by 1.1 cubed, or 52.59. We now add up these cash flows in the far right column, and we get initially negative 100 million. Add that to 27.27 million, and at the end of year one, we are still down 72.73 million. Year two, we add to this 16.53 million. We are down at the end of year two, 56.20 million. Year three, we add 52.59 million, and we are still down 3.61 million. So in this case, the cost of capital is high enough. We never break even and we should not invest in this project. Again, calculations related to both the payback period and the discounted payback period are done in more detail in individual Excel presentations dedicated to this subject. I thank you for watching this video.